Well, hello, I just wanna add my welcome to you to The Village Online. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. My name's Travis, I'm one of the pastors here at The Village. And uh, I wanna let you know about a couple things coming up. Number one, our Easter services are coming up in just a few weeks. And this year, we're going to have four Easter services. We'll have one on Saturday night at 6.30, and then we'll have three on Sunday morning in person at 8, 9.30, and 11. And we'll also be right here for an Easter service online. And, uh, and so if you're not in the area and not able to join us in person, uh, then you'd be able to, to join us here. But we'd love to have you here with us in person at one of those four services. I wanna encourage you to invite somebody to join you. There are a lot of people who've maybe moved into the area. Maybe you have some new neighbors that you could invite. Maybe you've met some new friends through school or work or, or something like that. And this would be a great opportunity for them to invite or for you to invite them to join you. And that could be in person. You could, uh, you could decide you're gonna come to one of our in-person and services and they could join you for that or it could be online maybe you could simply invite somebody to come over to your home and join you right there in your living room or wherever it is that you're watching from uh, and join you for that the second thing that i want to make sure you know about about our easter services is that we're partnering with an amazing organization called water for water for uh, provides water for people around the world people who don't already have access to clean drinking water and so uh, we've partnered with them for several years this year our goal is uh, to raise $35,000 through our Easter offering. We're giving away 100% of our Easter offering this year to Water 4, and $35,000 will allow them to put what's called a NUMA system, which is a piped water system, into a community in Waterloo, Sierra Leone, where we've done some, uh, some work in the past. It'll, it'll build on the infrastructure that we helped put in place last year. It will put some more infrastructure in place uh, that will be able to be added on to for the future. And it will provide uh, water, clean water for hundreds of people. That's, that's hundreds of kids who will be able to go to school now because they won't have to spend their morning and afternoon uh, walking to get water. That's, uh, that's more time that families are able to spend together. That's, that's less disease and less sickness in that community because people will be drinking clean water rather than disease infested water. And we get to do that together. So you can go online right now, thevillagenashville.com slash give. There's a drop down menu there that'll take you to water four. And if you go there, 100% of what you give through that online portal uh, will go to this Easter initiative. So uh, Easter services, Easter offering, make sure those things are on your radar. Hey, I want to pray for us today. Let's pray. God, I thank you for who you are. God, as we gather in this space online right now, uh, we gather as people who've experienced real life this week. Some of us have had the highest of highs. Some of us have had the lowest of lows. Some of us fall somewhere in between. But God, I believe that as we gather, that you want to speak to us wherever we are. And so God, right now, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would speak, speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, speak a message and a word that each and every one of us needs to hear. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So we're in week four of a series that we've been calling Questions Jesus Asks Us. Questions Jesus Asks Us. I think a lot of us, when we think about questions and we think about God, we think about the questions that we have for God. But the reality is, all throughout the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, Jesus asks more questions, many, many, many more questions than he answers. He asks questions of his followers. He asks questions of the people that he interacts with on the street. And, and when he asks those questions, what he's doing is he's inviting people into a relationship. Um, he's inviting people to consider new things. He's inviting people into healing. He's inviting people into new life. And so what we're doing during these six weeks that we're doing this series is we're just looking at some of the primary questions that Jesus asks us because I think that they weren't questions just intended for his first followers. I think the questions that Jesus asks us are questions that are intended for us today. So I want us to wrestle with these. Today's question comes from the Gospel of John chapter 5. If you're at home, you've got a Bible with you, you can turn to John 5 or you've got a Bible app. I just want to read this story and then I want to just talk about a couple pieces of it and I want to ask some questions that Jesus seems to be asking us. Now here's the story. It says, uh, John 5 starting in verse 1, it says, sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool 
which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. Uh, so uh, around the city of Jerusalem, there was a wall. There were gates all along the wall. They had different names. The, the name of this gate was the Sheep Gate. Aramaic is the language that Jesus and the disciples spoke. It's a variant of Hebrew. And so uh, that's kind of what that's saying. But in Aramaic, this, this pool is called Bethesda. And it's surrounded by five covered colonnades. And it says in verse 3, Here at this pool of Bethesda, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there, one of the people who was there, had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. I just kind of want to walk through this story. So uh, like I said, this pool sat outside of the gates of the city walls of, of Jerusalem. I've actually been there in 2014. I got the chance to go and see uh, the pool of Bethesda as it is today. I've got a couple pictures that I'll show you. This first picture is just, uh, it's just a picture. It's been excavated by archaeologists so you can see uh, where it was. Uh, second picture, I just decided I would take an artsy picture, and so I, I held my Bible up with this story uh, in, the, in the foreground, and in the background is the pool of Bethesda. So you can still see it there if you go there today. Now, the, the story was, um, and there's some other translations and, and other manuscripts of the Bible that kind of add this detail. Uh, the, the story and the thinking was that people would go to this pool. It was kind of known as a place where you might be able to experience healing. Right? And, and the story was that every once in a, in a while, an angel would come down and stir up the water in the pool of Bethesda. And, and when the water was stirred up, the first person in might experience the healing that they were looking for. Uh, I remember when we were there, we were with our, our tour guide. Our tour guide was named Munzer. Munzer was, uh, was somebody who'd actually grown up in the old city of Jerusalem. So uh, like thousands of, of years old city and structures and streets, and he'd grown up in it. So his, he said he was four years old and he would just be set free to run around all over the old city of Jerusalem. And, and he was a brilliant person. He knew so much, such an intelligent, brilliant person. And, and he was telling us about the pool of Bethesda. And I remember uh, somebody in our group raised their hand and they said, so, uh, so Munzer, like, what was it, um, what was it that stirred up the waters that made the people think that it was an angel? Like, was it a, a stream underneath? Was it some kind of spring underneath? And I just remember he, he looked and the question didn't make any sense to him. He just looked back and he said, an angel came and stirred up the waters. It's like using his hands. An angel came and stirred up the waters and then people were healed. It was an angel that came. It didn't make any sense to him that, that we wouldn't just, you know, we wouldn't just uh, think that that's what had actually happened in the story. Uh, anyway, so people would come to this place from miles around and they would sit there and they would wait and they would want to be healed. This man had been sitting there at this pool looking for healing for 38 years. 38 years. He'd been lying on his mat. Probably people would, would carry him in. And he would sit there, and for 38 years, he looked for healing that wouldn't come. Uh, I feel like maybe this relates to some things in our culture, right? But there are a lot of things that offer healing that don't actually provide it. You ever thought about that? There are a lot of things that offer healing that don't actually provide it. Uh, addiction. Addiction offers us things that it doesn't actually provide. Uh, politics. Politics offers us things. It offers a, a worldview. It offers a, a way of life. It offers a, a vision that maybe it doesn't actually provide. Um, lots of different self-help books, right? Self-help books, so many of them, they're bestsellers, but they offer things that they don't actually provide. 
uh, this, uh, this specific place, the Pool of Bethesda, um, it was sometimes, at, at some points, it was thought to be a pagan shrine to the Greek god Asclepius. Asclepius is, um, was the god of, of Greek god of medicine or the Greek god of healing. And people thought, if I'll just go to this place of Asclepius, I'll find healing, right? We know that historically people would do that, but we also know historically that this Pool of Bethesda didn't follow through on what it offered. It didn't follow through on what it said uh, you, it, it would provide or it would offer to the people. And so for 38 years, this man was coming here to this place that didn't offer what it actually said it offered. And I wonder if there are a lot of us who right now in this moment, like we're looking for things in places that don't actually offer the thing that they say they're offering. How many of us are, are stuck we're stuck in a situation, we're stuck in a circumstance, we're, we're looking for something, we're looking for healing, we're looking for uh, a, a relief or a release from our pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, physical pain, and we just keep returning back to these places that don't actually offer what they say they offer. If you look at this, pull this picture back up again. If you look at this picture again, this place that offered healing, all right, is it still offering healing today? Is it still in operation today? Are people still going to this place today to get the healing that they're looking for? Do you know anybody who's currently praying to Asclepius for healing? No. Why? Why? Because this pool didn't offer what it said it offered. Because the Greek god Asclepius didn't actually offer the healing that people thought he offered. And so here's this man, he's stuck there, he's, he's stuck in this situation, he's just doing the same thing over and over and over again. What's the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And that's where this man is. So Jesus comes up on the scene. And, uh, and, and Jesus, it says that, that Jesus saw him lying there. Uh, Jesus maybe observed him for a while. He asked some people around what was, what was going on with this man because uh, it says that Jesus learned that this man had been in this condition for a long time. And so Jesus approached him and he, and he asked him a question that I wonder if he's asking you today. Um, he actually asked him a question and then in the moment, this man had two decisions that he needed to make. Here's the question. Jesus approached him and he said this, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? The first decision the man had to make was, did he actually want to get well? Does he actually want to get well, or is he just content with business as usual? You've been coming to this same spot for 38 years every day to this spot that's not giving you what you desire, but the question is, do you actually want to get well? I think that's a good question for a lot of us. Right? Is, is there something that, that you're longing for? Is there something that you're desiring? Is there something that you're struggling with? But you've, you've set up a system, you've set up a lifestyle that reinforces the fact that you keep going to the same places over and over and over again that aren't offering you the healing that you so desperately desire. And the question that you've got to answer, the question that I've got to answer, we've all got to answer this, is do you actually want to get well? Do you actually want to get well or are you just content with business as usual? I mean, you might, you might say things like, well, you know, it's, it's not really that bad. It's not really that bad, right? Um, I don't drink that much. I mean, I could stop if I wanted to. I don't drink that much. Um, I'm not that angry, <laughs> you know? The problem's not, it's not that bad. Like, yeah, sure, the, the, the marriage is not so good, but I mean, it's, we're surviving, it's fine. My relationship with, you know, with these significant people in my life, it's, you know, it's broken, it's dysfunctional, but it's okay, it's just the way it's always been. Do you actually want to get well? Do you want to get well? Why does Jesus ask that question? Jesus asked that question because He's not just curious. He's not just trying to make conversation. Jesus asks that question because Jesus knows that he has the power and the ability and the willingness to give this man the healing that he desired. Like I said, nobody's praying to Asclepius today. Nobody's going to the pool of Bethesda today. Why? Because they don't work. But, but every single day around the world, right now in 2022, 
people are looking to Jesus Christ for the healing, for their soul, for their body, for their spirit, that they so desperately desire. Why? Because Jesus has a track record to back it up, right? Jesus not only has the desire to heal, Jesus has a track record to back it up. Do you want to get well? Jesus is asking that because he knows in this moment he has what the man actually needs, what the man is actually looking for. Do you want to get well? He asked him that question. Now, I love the response. It's honest, right? It's honest. It's, it's the kind of response that you might hear if Jesus were to ask that question today. He says, well, sir, the invalid replied to Jesus. He said, well, I mean, I've got, I've got no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. I mean, while I'm trying to get in, I mean, someone else goes down ahead of me. The man just has excuses. He's just got excuses for, for why he's not able to do the thing or why he's not receiving the thing that he wants. When Jesus says, do you want to get well? He starts with excuses. I wonder if you know anybody like that, right? I wonder if you know anybody like that. When you ask them or you push them or you press them, maybe they don't actually want to get well. They, they just want to offer excuses or reasons why it's not working the way that they want it to work. And, and here's what happened next. It says, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. So Jesus says, do you want to get well? The man has excuses. Jesus looks back at him and he says, okay, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And the story says this, at once the man was cured. At once the man was was cured. But here's the second decision that the man has to make in the moment. The first decision is, does he actually want to get well or is he all talk? The second decision that he's got to make is, is he willing to follow Jesus out of it? Is he willing to follow Jesus? Is he willing to actually do what Jesus said? And I love this. It says, Jesus said, pick up your mat, or get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And then it says, at once the man was cured. But when did he know that he was cured? Did he know that he was cured in that moment? Well, no, here's what it says next. It says, at once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat, and he walked. And in that moment, in the moment when he did what Jesus told him to do, in a moment of obedience that followed the moment of healing, that's when the man knew that he'd been healed. I've just been imagining this scenario uh, this week as I've thought about this scripture. The man had been there for 38 years. He'd been lying on his mat the same way, the, day after day after day. People had carried him in on the mat. They'd carried him back out. He'd not found him. They carried him in and he'd not found the healing he was looking for. They carried him back out. They carried him in. He didn't find the healing he was looking for. They carried him back out. He, he began to believe that, that that's just the state that he was going to be stuck in. Right? What in that, what would have happened in that moment if Jesus would have said, get up, pick up your mat, and walk? Immediately he was healed, but he decided not to follow through and to do the thing that Jesus told him to do. Right? Is it possible that the man could have laid there for another 38 years on the mat, completely healed, but he never would have known it? Because he wasn't willing to, to put a step of obedience into place in his life. Like, what if he'd been cured? but he wasn't willing to take the next step. Like, could that be true for us? Could that be true for some of us? Right? Maybe Jesus has already provided the healing that you've been looking for, but you don't know it because you haven't been willing to take that next step. Now, there's another story in John chapter two. I love this. So if you just flip back a few pages in the New Testament, John chapter two, it's actually the first miracle that happens uh, in the Gospels. Uh, first, first miracle story that happens in the ministry of Jesus. I love the story, and it's not just because Jesus changes water into wine, but I love it because in the story, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she gives the best advice that any human on the planet could receive. She gives the absolute best advice that anybody on the planet could receive. It is the best advice for you. It's the best advice for me. Any situation, any circumstance, this advice that she gives will work for you. Here's what happens in the story. John chapter two, it says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. It's a, a region in the Galilee, or a, a, a little town in the Galilee region 
Um, Jesus' mother was there. His disciples were there. He was there. So Jesus and his mom go to this wedding party together. It says, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Uh, I, I love this because this is a... Um, this is an instance, maybe you've experienced this with your own mom. This is an instance where Mary, the mother of Jesus, she makes an observation, but it's not really just an observation. You ever had that experience with your mom, right? So she makes an observation to Jesus, but it comes with an expectation that, that he's going to what? That he's going to fix it, right? She's basically saying, they have no more wine, fix it. It's like if your mom, you know, maybe, maybe at some point during your childhood, your mom would make an observation to you and she would say something like, your socks are on the floor. Right? She's, not just, she's not just trying to communicate to you that your socks are on the floor. She's trying to communicate that it is time for you to pick your socks up off of the floor. Or your mom might say, um, your mom might say, your room is a mess. Right? In that moment, she's not just saying to you, your room is a mess. She's saying, your room is a mess, and I need you to what? I need you to fix it. I need you to do something about it. That's what's happening in this. She's saying, there is no more wine. And essentially she said, I want you to do some Jesus stuff because I'm your mom and I know you can and see if you can fix the problem. Uh, Jesus responds in a way that, that actually in his day and age, it wasn't disrespectful. It, this, wasn't a, uh, this wasn't laced with any disrespect, but it's maybe not something that, that you should say to your own mom today. He says, uh, woman, why do you involve me? Uh, woman, why do you, don't, don't say that to your mom. Okay, woman, why do you involve me? That's what Jesus says. And, and, and then he replies back, my hour has not yet come. He's like, I don't, I don't think it's time for this. And then Mary gives the best possible advice that anybody could ever give about Jesus. She looks at the servants and she simply says this, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. There's no better advice that somebody could give you on this planet than to do whatever it is that Jesus tells you to do. Any situation, it works. Any circumstance, it works. Any, uh, any scenario that you're facing, it works. Do whatever Jesus tells you. The two most important questions that you can ask yourself in life. Number one, what is it that Jesus is saying to me right now in this scenario, in this situation, in this circumstance? Number two, what am I going to do about what Jesus is saying to me? Right, what, if, what if we could all just begin to, to ask and answer those questions in our lives? I think it would take care of 99.9% .9 of everything that we ever deal with if we could just ask and answer those two questions. What is it that Jesus is saying to me in this moment? What am I going to do about what Jesus is saying to me in this moment? I mean, imagine a scenario where, where you're in a group of people and that's the heart, that's, that's the primary question that you're asking each other to ask. What is it that Jesus is saying to me right now? What am I going to do about what Jesus is saying to me? Imagine, I'm a parent, right? Imagine... Imagine a scenario, like as a parent, there's, there's maybe no, no two other questions that I would rather my kids learn to ask and answer than those two questions. When they're, when they're growing up, as they graduate, as they go off to college, what if I could just trust that my, my kids were asking and answering those two questions? What is Jesus saying to me right now? What am I going to do about what Jesus is saying to me right now? What is Jesus saying to me right now? What am I going to do about what Jesus is saying to me right now? I love what happens in this story because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Here, here's the thing. The things that Jesus asks us to do and tells us to do, they don't always make a lot of rational sense, but here's what happens. Jesus looks at the servants and he says, okay, there's six stone water jars over there at the entrance to the party. They're the water jars that people have been using to wash their hands as they've been coming in. It's hand-washing water. It's dirty hand-washing water. Uh, people have kind of dripped the water out as they've washed their hands and used the water. So here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to go over, I want you to fill all of those stone water jars back up to the brim. And so the servants do that. And then Jesus says, here's what I want you to do next. I want you to take a ladle, go over there and scoop out some water from one of those stone water jars and take it over to the master of the banquet and let him drink it. Do whatever he tells you to do. Do whatever he tells you to do. Whatever It doesn't matter how it sounds. Whatever he tells you to do, do that. Imagine if you're in that scenario. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It doesn't make any rational sense whatsoever. Uh, take, take a ladle from the dirty hand-washing water, carry it over to the master of the party, and let him drink from it. 
but they do it. They do it. They take like eight steps from the stone water jars to the master of the party. And in that moment, it turns, uh, it turns not only into some wine, but it turns into the best wine that this guy has ever tasted in his life. But they wouldn't have known it if they hadn't taken the step of obedience. Right, the man in the story, he wouldn't have known that he was cured. He wouldn't have known that he was healed unless he had taken the steps of obedience and done whatever it was that Jesus asked him to do. Two questions for us today. Two questions. Number one, I want you to think about a difficult situation that you're facing. Right? If you're alive, if you're breathing, if you're human, you're facing difficulty. It's, it's part of the human experience. I want you to think about a difficult situation or circumstance that you're facing. Maybe it's something personal. Maybe it's something physical. Maybe it's a spiritual issue that you're facing. Maybe it's something emotional. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's mental. Just think about, think about a difficulty that you're facing that you'd like to get to the other side of. Number one, do you want to get well? Do you actually want to get well? Or are you just kind of content with business as usual? Right? Maybe you've, you've just learned to deal with it. Maybe you're just kind of doing the same things over and over because you've just gotten used to it. Maybe you actually, uh, maybe actually in some ways, you, you like the, the situation or the circumstances that surround it. Right? This, this man was being carried in every day. He had people carrying him in, carrying him out. He'd gotten used to that. Do you actually want to get well? Question number one. Question number two. Right? Assuming that Jesus is still the God of healing, which I very much assume. He's got a 2,000-year track record on that. Right? Are you willing to do what Jesus tells you to do? Are you willing to follow Jesus out of wherever it is that you are? Listen, for some, for some, people, for some people, what Jesus might be asking you to do is to get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Right? Jesus, perhaps, perhaps there is some dramatic physical healing that Jesus wants to enact in your life. Right? For some of you, for some of you, the next step that you need to take to follow Jesus out of it is you need to get help. Maybe you need to go to the doctor. Right? Maybe, maybe you need to talk to somebody, talk to a professional who can help you sort out the things that you're dealing with. Maybe that's the step that Jesus is calling you to do. Right? Maybe you need to begin praying again or praying for the first time. Maybe you need to recommit to a life of, of faith and worship. Maybe you need to reach out and have that difficult conversation that might lead to healing instead of, instead of just assuming over and over again that that person doesn't want to have anything to do with you and, and they wronged you and, and you shouldn't do anything about it. Right? What is it? that Jesus is calling you to do? Are you willing to do what Jesus is asking you to do no matter what it is? No matter how ridiculous it sounds, are you willing to take that step? Do you want to get well? Are you willing to take that step? I want to pray. Uh, I want to pray for you today. I also want to invite you. I want you to know, uh, I want you to know that we're always here to pray with you and pray for you. In fact, if you're online and, and you're, not, you're not near us, you can email us at prayer at the village and, and we would be so happy to pray with you, to meet with you, to talk with you, to do anything we can to support you on, on whatever it is and in whatever it is that you're facing and dealing with and struggling with in life. So I want to pray. I want to ask you wherever you are, uh, if you just close your eyes, take a deep breath. God, we, uh, we're here today as people who need you. God, we need your healing power in our lives, in our hearts, in our spirits, in our relationships. God, we're here because we want to get well. We want to get well. 
So God, today I, I pray for healing. I pray that you pour out your healing Holy Spirit on each and every one of us right now. You know even more than we do where we need to be healed, where we need to be restored, where things are broken, what it is that needs to be fixed, you know, God. And so we give that to you. We entrust ourselves to you. And God, I pray that right now that, that maybe we'd hear your voice. That we could hear your voice. God, would you speak to us? Would you, would you say to us, whatever our version of, of get up, take up your mat and walk is, would you speak that to us right now? God, what is it that we need to do? What are the steps that we need to take? Would you speak that to us right now? God, whatever that step is, Whatever that step is, I pray that right now you'd give us the boldness to take that step, to do what it is that you've asked us to do. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.